Welcome back to Chess TV. It's a new week and a new episode. We've got a new story in the chess history for you. A complicated chess puzzle that promises to test your skills. Albert is tackling a new subject in Machiavelli and me. And Alfred will continue to guide us through the slippery path that is the Queen's Indian in the opening school. But before we hand over to Albert, here's an update on what's been going on in the world of chess. The Korsakan Chess League has announced the calendar for 2012 with a number of important international competitions. The 16th Korsakan Circuit, which is to be played in October, has a prize fund of 60,000 euros. The highlight of the year will certainly be the visit of the women world champion Hu Yifan from China, who will face off against European women champion Victoria Tsumilte in the match of the champions in May in Porto Vecchio. We're certainly looking forward to it. Well, speaking of the Women World Champion, Hu Yifan, next up for her is the Reykjavik Open, which starts on March the 6th at the Harpa Concert Hall, the spectacular waterfront concert hall in downtown Reykjavik, Iceland. Hu Yifan is actually the second reigning Women World Champion to take part in the history of the tournament. Nonaga Prindashvili played in the inaugural 1964 edition, which was won by Michael Mikkel Tal. We'd like to wish Miss Yifan good luck, although we doubt she'll need it, just coming off a great result in Gibraltar, where she shared first place with Nigel Short. Fidel is announcing that they've managed to sign sponsoring deals with companies CNC and Aegon worth millions and causing a bit of a controversy in the world of chess. All I have to say about that is, hey, if you don't want the money, we would gladly take it. We've been running a non-profit zero-budget TV production for seven years. <laughs> Well, joke aside, the U.S. Chess Championships are coming up. The fields are set for both, both the 2012 U.S. Championship and 2012 U.S. Women's Championship, which are scheduled to help be held simultaneously May the 7th through May the 20th in St. Louis. Both Grandmaster Gapakamski and International Master Anna Zatomsky are looking to defend their respective titles against strong and determined fields. And a huge congratulations are in order to Nana Zaginze, who managed to win the ACP Women's Cup after quite the finish. Pia Kramning entered the final round as a sole leader, while Nana Zaginze and Katarina Lano were sharing the second place half a point behind. In the last round, Pia Kramning played a quick draw in the game against Katarina Lano and then waited for the development in the game between Tatiana Kosniceva and Zaginze. The Georgian player scored the victory, caught up with Pia Kramning and then outsmarted her in the tie-break match after a two drawn blitz games in the final Armageddon game. Congratulations! And now, it's time for Albert, so here we go. There are two ways for the average citizen to become a prince either by getting the support of other citizens, the democratic way, or by committing criminal and abominable acts. Today I'm going to concentrate on the second method, that is, reaching power by atrocities. There are many examples of rulers throughout history who have reached their positions through indiscriminate violence and atrocities. One example is Christian II, who tricked the entire Swedish court to a party to then behead every one of them. The happening has gone down in history as the Stockholm bloodbath. And even if you can't really claim that Christian II was a commoner, a man of the people, I do believe that this example proves my point. But how do you stay in power after you conquered it in such a beastly way? Well, Machiavelli argues that it's all about planning. And as we all know, the same goes for chess. Just like Bent Larsen said, you have to have a plan. Machiavelli argues that there, there are well-used and poorly used cruelties. Once used, the cruelties should be committed in one go, stop quickly, be necessary in order to secure power, and bring as many positive effects as possible for the people. The poor use of cruelties, on the other hand, is when there might be few in the beginning, but more in the end. Failure to use cruelty well will result in loss of power in, in one way or another. And this is where planning comes into play. Anyone who wants to retain power long when he, conquer, when he conquers a country 
should make a rough estimate of how much violence he needs to use and then do it all at once so he doesn't have to repeat it every day. Because in that way the people will feel safe after the original power switch and the new ruler can win over them with, the, with his kindness. Those who fail to plan, either because of indecision or mistakes, will always have to keep the knife in their hands, so to speak. In addition, the, that prince won't be able to count on his people's support, since they will always be afraid of new atrocities and won't trust him. And trust has to go both ways. Now, Machiavelli says that cruelties should always be executed at once, so that they will feel less painful while good deeds should be proportioned out to make a lengthy experience. And then, the, uh, Machiavelli goes on to what I think is the most important point of all. Namely, that above all, a prince has to live in sync with his people, knowing what's going on. Because if he's surprised by development and lets adversities control his actions and turn them into reactions, it would be too late to use cruelty as to cure the problem. And doing good deeds won't help either. It's, well, nobody likes forced kindness, and no one would be grateful for that kind. So, in summary, a proactive plan of action is always much more successful than a reactive one. And that, my friends, applies to most areas of life, not just chess. In last week's episode, we analyzed Black's fifth move bishop to b4 check in the Queen's Indian, a move which, after White's bishop to d2, opens up for a lot of different variations. In our previous episode, we saw what happened after bishop takes on d2, so this time we'll analyze Black's alternate moves a5, queen to e7, and c5. Black can also play bishop to e7, but that has been analyzed in an earlier episode. A5 differs from bishop takes on d2 quite a lot, and the purpose besides keeping the bishop on b4 is that after an exchange, black will have an open file for his rook, and the pawn on b4 also hinders white from developing his knight to c3. So instead of exchanging bishops, white should castle kingside. If black now does the same, white plays bishop to f4, and black is forced to retreat with his bishop because of the threat c5 followed by a3 winning the bishop. So black should now retreat from b4 and then he can choose between bishop to d6 or and bishop to e7. Bishop to e d6 followed by an exchange in d6 is usually avoided by, because of the double pawns on d5 and the awkward b6 pawn. Bishop to e7 is followed by knight to c3, knight to e4 and queen to c2. Once again, we have reached the characteristic position for the Queen's Indian, where the central point in the position is the fight for the e4 square. Of course, there are some alternations from the position we got in an earlier episode, but the foundation is the same. Other than playing a5, black can also choose c5. This move is quite strange and an exchange on b4 furthers the black pawn from the center. But actually, black can hold up in the center by playing d6, allowing for a future e5 or d5 depending on the position. This would block black white from doing anything in the center, even though he has a pawn majority there. Another option for black is to play queen to e7. This move protects the bishop on b4 much like a5 or c5 did, but this without any rash pawn moves. This allows black to stall even further when it comes to deciding on how to use his pawns. Another advantage with this move is that it prepares for black to further on in the game play e5. White should now, like after a5 was played castle kingside so that his bishop becomes unpinned and now black should exchange bishops on d2. As we see here, black should exchange bishops on d2 either way, which is why white's a3 isn't needed it would only throw a move down the drain. To recapture in d2 is a certainty, but deciding which piece to take with is not as obvious. 
To capture with the queen is the most popular option, but recapturing with either knight is also possible. The b knight is the more natural choice, but to take with the f knight can be more fun if you want to rattle your opponent. The reason why people choose to recapture with the queen instead of the b knight is since white prefers the knight to develop to c3. Now black should castle king side and after white's knight to c3, black mainly has to choose between d5 and d6. d6 is played in order to open up for the b knight to go to d7 and then to play e5, giving us a position somewhat reminiscent of the king's Indian. The move d5 is more straightforward and creates more commotion in the center. White should now exchange in d5. The c file is open and black's c pawn is weak, so of course white places rook on c1. And black, not wanting to lose his pawn, plays knight to a6, preparing for c5. The position is somewhat strange, especially the placement of the black pieces on the queen side. But c5 will help black to break through and give him a more natural position with central c and d pawns ruling in the center. But white is of course not in a worse position because of the pawns, because they will be under attack from white since white has two open files directly against the two pawns. The game has a lot in store, but it's still quite equal, allowing for an interesting opportunities to arise. But I'll end this week's episode of the opening school now, and I'll be back again next week, so see you then. This week we'll once again take a look at a difficult chess puzzle. This one has been composed by Michael Lipton, a successful economist with a great interest in chess and the author of two chess puzzle books. And since this is a composed chess puzzle, the position is quite special. This requires that you think in a somewhat broader perspective and not only consider the moves that feel right. Well, you have one minute to figure out the checkmate white performs in two moves. Good luck. Well, the position is actually quite so chaotic, so in order to solve it, we must analyze it from the perspective that there is a checkmate here in two moves. If we look at the black king situation, we notice that it does not have any free squares to go to. The next step is to check which of our pieces are guarding these squares and which aren't. Our only pieces that are not included in the work of guarding these squares is our knight on b3 and our queen. What's important to note here is that the knight could checkmate on c5 or on d4 if it wasn't for the rook and bishop that could capture the knight. So what we can conclude from all this is that the first move will be a queen move after all. So which different moves do we have with our queen then? If the queen could only get to c4 in one move, we could have a checkmate after that the rook blocked it and we capture it. But it does however take two moves for the queen to get to c4 and after the capture of the rook we are already up in three moves. Trying to get the queen to c6 does not work either because when we finally get the queen to c6 after two moves, black just blocks the check with, uh, with either the bishop or the rook. And the plan to get the queen to f5 is also just useless because the black bishop then just captures our queen and then when we capture back with the pawn, which in fact is a checkmate, we've already used three moves again. But there is actually one square we can place our queen on which looks very promising, namely e5. We can get to the e5 square with our queen in three different ways, by playing queen a5, queen c3 or queen g3. If we play with queen a5, black can't do that much at all. If black plays bishop c5 in order to block the checkmate, we capture the bishop with our knight and with a checkmate. 
Let's go back and let black try the rook d5 move. In that case, we checkmate by capturing the rook with the queen. And if black instead chooses bishop d6, queen d5 is a checkmate. But if black plays rook d6, our move knight c5 is not a checkmate because what black can do is to escape with the king to e5. This means that the first move queen a5 is not the right move for us. So let's instead try queen c3. The simple answer to this one is bishop d6 and we just don't have any checkmate at all. So what happens on queen g3? This move does indeed look promising. On the, uh, on the black move, bishop d6, knight d4 is a checkmate thanks to the queen which guards the e5 square. If black chooses to respond with rook d6 instead, we play knight c5 checkmate again. And if black tries to cover the e5 square with the rook by playing rook d5, we checkmate by simply capturing the rook with our pawn. And finally, black's desperate move bishop f5 checks Let's, let's us checkmate black by capturing the bishop with the pawn checkmate. Well, this puzzle was really tricky because of all the possible variations that had to be analyzed. If you managed to come to the conclusion that it was either the queen a5, c3 or g3 that could be the first right move, you do deserve a point for this time too. So, well done everyone. Now it's time for this week's episode of The Chess History with Professor Anna Johansson, so enjoy. Some time ago I talked about a 17th century chessboard that I found at the Arts Institute in Chicago. It was a fine specimen of relief marquetry from the city of Eger in Bohemia, very similar to the one we looked at at the school cluster castle. Well, most people visit the Arts Institute for the great collections of Impressionist paintings and other classic paintings. But the chessboard box from Eger and a cabinet cupboard from Augsburg are of course also very good reasons to visit the museum. I actually also found another chess object there that I will focus on today. To find this object one has to search the modern arts part of the museum and it was art by the American artist known as Man Ray that I took a closer look at. We see him in this Wikipedia photo taken by Carl van Fechtem. He lived between 1890 and 1976, and his original name was Emanuel Radnitsky. He was American but spent a lot of time in Paris and was a close friend with Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp is, aside from being a famous as artist, also well known for his great chess interest and was an advanced player himself. He was, according to himself, rather a victim of chess and almost obsessed with the game. According to Wikipedia, he said at some occasion, chess has all the beauty of art and much more. It cannot be commercialized. Chess is much purer than art in its social position. And at another occasion, he stated that while all artists are not chess players, all chess players are artists. Well, there has been much said and written about Duchamp and his relation to chess, for instance by Stig Jonasson in our club magazine. So today I will focus on Man Ray. The two friends actually played chess against each other in a short film, so Man Ray was also a chess enthusiast. He was known as a modernist and above all for his photographic art. I also noted that he was very interested in mechanics and helped Duchamp with so-called kinematic art. It was in 1921 that he went to Paris, where he became well known in art circles and got acquainted with the surrealists there. He photographed most famous artists like Picasso and Miro and other famous personalities like James Joyce. In 1927 he made a work that now is in the Arts Institute in Chicago and looks like this. 
Yes, it's an elegant chess set made in brass, silver and gold and is in itself a good reason to visit the Modern Arts Museum or the Modern Arts part of the museum, I should say. And note the elegant knights that actually are heads of violins. Well, as I'm telling this story about Man Ray and his time in Paris, I can take the opportunity to also mention that there is a good reason to visit Paris. Last time when I was there, I found a patisserie that served this fine piece of pastry. So as you see, there are many good reasons to travel. With this little excursion into the art and chess history, we end today and we'll be back next week with another theme. So see you then. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode and that you'll be back again next week. So hope to see you then. Bye.